When we look at pipelines that use latches instead of registers, we find that they have really attractive properties, but they also offer specific dangers. So this is a pipeline that uses latches instead of registers. Uh, there are combinational logic blocks between latch pairs. Uh, in this case, we are using uh, two clocks, clock one and clock two. The two clocks are non-overlapping, which means that when one is active, the other is inactive. And therefore, clock one, for example, would look like this. And then clock two would have the opposite sense and will be high when clock one is low and low when clock one is high. In this case, all the registers we are using, L1 through L4, can be active high latches. An alternative way to do this is uh, to alternate active high and active low latches and use the same clock. So we could, for example, use clock 1 for all the latches, but in that case, L2 and L4 will have to be active low latches, while L1 and L3 can remain active high latches. So if we look at what's happening here, um, we can basically think of data passing from L1 to L2 and think about how much time this data has. So that's the kind of the calculation we did in a register pipeline. And we ended up with the well-known uh, equation for det determining the uh, period of the clock in a register pipeline, except that in this case, L1 has only T over two uh, time available because the period of the clock T is actually divided between the two latches and therefore uh, latch one should be able to finish its um, all of its tasks within a time period T over two and therefore um, we should be we should have T over two be greater than or equal to TPD one plus TDQ one plus T setup two. So what this would allow us to do is it would allow us to finish and reach latch L2 before we are running out, before we run out of time T over two. Now, this way of looking at it is very similar to uh, uh, how we looked at it in register pipelines, but it's too simplistic and it ignores one thing, which is that latches are active during a phase of the clock, not at an edge of the clock. What we are doing here is we are forcing the data to be ready at the, act, the rising edge of the clock, clock two. So we make it arrive at the input of L2 before that rising edge. It actually doesn't need to arrive at the rising edge of clock two. It needs to arrive anytime within the high phase of clock two and L2 would still be able to latch it. As long as it arrives a time before T setup, before the uh, edge of the clock. And so let's look at this uh, diagram, for example, at this waveform. Um, here we have uh, nodes D, W, and X. And so uh, when D changes, this causes uh, the data to exit through L1, takes it on TDQ1, and then to propagate through CLB1, which takes TPD1, and then it should arrive at the point W not actually uh, at the rising edge of clock two, but any time within the high phase of clock two and before uh, T set up before, uh, uh, before clock two ends. And therefore, what we should be writing is that TDQ1 plus TPD1 plus T set up two is less than T, right? So that's what it should be. But what happens then is that W is going to be ready at this point, right, which allows the data to exit L2 and exit CLB2 and be ready at X. But when should it be ready at X? It should be ready at X within the active phase of clock one. So it should be ready at X within this phase of clock one. And so now the amount of time available for, for the data to go through this path has been reduced to this amount. So while data had the possibility of taking all of this time to finish in the first path, this would eat up from the amount of time available for the second path, right? And so how do we do this calculation? How do we know if we are still okay or not? We're gonna think about the first path, let's call this path I, 
and the second path, which is path double I. Now, path I has taken more time than it should because it has encroached into the active phase of clock two. By how much time? We will call that the amount of borrowed time or the amount of slack that the first path has borrowed from the second path. And this amount of time is equal to the amount of time that the path took minus the amount of time that it should have taken. So the first path is taking TDQ1 plus TPD1, but it, this should have been finished within less than T over 2, so we're going to do minus T over 2. So if this, is, if this amount is more than T over 2, then the first path has borrowed a positive amount. This positive amount is borrowed from the second path. Now, how much time does the second path have? It has T minus this amount that has been borrowed. So it doesn't even have to finish within T over 2 as long as this hasn't um, taken more than T over 2. It has T minus the amount borrowed to finish. Now, path 2 could also borrow some time. You know, it could have positive borrowing of its own. Or it could have zero borrowing. It, should, it could finish within T over 2 exactly. Or it could even have negative borrowing. If it has negative borrowing, that means that it finishes within less than T over 2, which is the case that we see here. It, it's actually finishing very fast. So you see T2 is actually pretty fast, right? In that case, this negative borrowing of the second path is going to make up for some of the borrowing that the first path has done. And this allows the third path then to borrow a little bit more. So what's the rule? The rule is that the running total of the amount of borrowed time cannot exceed t over 2. So when we borrow extra time, we cannot exceed t over 2. So what's the running total of borrowed time? So at path i, we are going to borrow tpdi plus tdqi minus t over 2. This is the amount of borrowing. For path 1, i was equal to 1. The running uh, borrow Borrowing time is going to be the summation from i equals 1 to whatever uh, stage we are, stage j. So the amount of total amount borrowed at stage j is the summation of uh, this amount. Right? So this total borrowed time cannot exceed t over 2, but not just t over 2, t over 2 minus t setup, because we have to arrive t setup before the falling edge of the clock. Now, this running total borrowed time cannot exceed this amount for all i. So it's just not at the end of the latch that we have to check. We have to check after every stage. Not a single stage can exceed t over 2 total borrowing. So after every stage, we have to make sure that this running sum does not exceed t over 2. So if we do this from the very beginning of the latch loop till the end, we can ensure that there will be no exceeding the amount of borrowing we can do. So why do we do all this? This obviously is a lot more complicated than a registered pipeline, and it is. Uh, we do this because what you can see here is that when we have a fast path and a slow path, what we are allowing the fast path to do is to make up a little bit for what the slow path is doing. We're allowing the slow path to borrow some of the slack that the fast path creates. And so this allows us to operate this pipeline, this pipeline of latches, at a frequency that is actually close to the average of all the path. Whereas if we are in a registered pipeline, you have to operate at the frequency that the slowest path, the critical path, allows you. And therefore, when you have path with disparate uh, speeds, with disparate propagation delays, a latch pipeline is always going to give you a better performance than a registered pipeline. So, you know, it, it might be a little bit um, enticing to think that the reason we have the ability to borrow slack is because we are using latches of the opposite sense. We are alternating positive or like active high latches and active low latches. But that's not the case because if you have a registered pipeline in which you have a positive edge triggered 
register and the negative edge triggered register, let's see what's, hap what, what's gonna happen here. So uh, when the positive edge of the clock comes, uh, the data D is gonna be registered in, uh, in the register R1. It's gonna take TDQ to appear uh, at uh, TCQ actually to appear at the input of CLB1, and then it's gonna take TPD1 to appear at the point W, right? And um, this should all be finished at a time T setup before, before the falling edge of the clock. So we don't actually have the time, we don't have the ability to borrow into the zero phase of the clock. We have to finish before the falling edge of the clock. So whenever you mix positive edge trigger, the negative edge triggered resistors, you will find that you are actually um, dividing the period that you have available by two. This is not gonna help you, it's actually gonna hurt you. So the reason that latch, latch pipelines allow you to have faster operation is not because they alternate, it's because they are level sensitive. Registers make a hard decision about to, uh, whether or not to register at the edge, and therefore they cannot allow you to have slack borrowing. So what's the judgment on, on latches? Should we or should we not use them? And the fact of the matter is if you have a fast path, that fast path uh, in a commercial chip is probably going to be using latches. But latches are very dangerous to use if you don't know what you're doing um, for a couple of reasons. Um, there's reasons that have to do with FPGAs specifically and reasons that have to do with both FPGAs and ASICs. Um, so one, one thing that I really don't like about latches is that they allow um, glitches and logical hazards that happen in combinational logic blocks to uh, propagate down the pipeline. So when you, whenever you have a, a, a combinational logic block, it's too simplistic to think that the data is going to make a single transition in response to a single transition at the input. In fact, what, what's going to happen is that you often see the output of a combina combinational logic block doing something like this, doing a glitch. And we will take some time uh, in later videos to, to look at what, why these glitches happen. When you uh, use pipelines, when you use registered pipelines, they will not actually look at the output of the combinational logic block until it has finished and all these glitches have resolved. So it, it will look somewhere around here. And so you don't have to worry about these glitches. With latches, the glitches are going to... Uh, uh, are going to propagate down the pipeline and are going to have an effect on you. They're going to have an impact, at least in terms of power. But more importantly, the thing about uh, latches is that they don't have, uh, uh, you know, uh, specialized hardware in FPGAs. So the logic cells of FPGAs do not know how to implement latches. They only have registers. Whenever you ask them to implement latches, they're going to do it, but using lookup tables which leads to a very inferior latch with very inferior timing, um, timing properties. The other thing is FPGAs have extremely good uh, clock distribution networks. And therefore skew, which is differential delay in clock, is going to be very small in FPGAs. Skew is one of the things that uh, latch pipelines use uh, intensively to enhance slack borrowing. So there's actually no real benefit to using latches in an FPGA. ASICs, on the other hand, do not have, uh, you know, the low skew uh, clock distribution networks that FPGAs have, and they do have specialized standard cells to implement really efficient latches. And therefore, uh, we have to ask why not use latch pipelines in, in, in ASICs? And the answer is you can sometimes use them but you have to use them carefully. And the caveats are, you have to use a very short latch pipeline, and you have to be careful about timing. You almost have to do the timing for the latch pipeline manually. Why? So, I mean, let's think about a registered pipeline. The registered pipeline is like this, right? Between registers, there are gonna be path, right? So what does the place and route tool do when it's trying to place and route a, uh, a register pipeline. What it does is it places this register, places this register, places this uh, combinational logic block, and then it routes between them. And then goes and checks if the total delay in this path is uh, 
has positive slack, then we are fine and it can move to the next path. If it places and routes the next path correctly, it can move to the one after. If there's a problem with the one after, it can keep trying to change the placement and routing of the one after until it resolves it, or maybe it needs even to uh, go back and change one of the previous path until it resolves it. But what's happening here is that mainly, you know, the, the, the normal flow of things for ASIC placement and routing is that once a path has been placed and routed safely without setup time violations and hold time violations, the placement and routing tool can leave it alone and go to place other path independently. The, the registers are the beginning and the end of placement and routing in a latch pipeline. And I sometimes use the uh, term latch loop instead of latch pipeline to preserve the word pipeline for registers. So in a latch loop, the problem is if you go and place this latch and this register and this uh, combination of logic block and this latch, and you make sure that they have achieved closure of, of some sort, and then you go and place this guy and this guy, how can you check that they have achieved closure as well? Remember that closure for a uh, loop, for a latch loop, depends on the running total uh, borrowing. So we cannot actually place a path and think of it as done because this path could possibly borrow from the next path or it could be introducing negative borrowing, allowing the next path to borrow more. And therefore, the placement and routing tool needs to look at all the path while it's placing any path because it needs to think about the running total of borrowing and how each path affects the other. Therefore, placement and routing is going to be very, very hard. And so what do you do about it? What you do is you begin a latch loop and end it at registers. And in between, everything that happens in the latch loop is isolated and you allow the tool to do placement and routing for this latch loop independently from the rest of the pipeline and you keep this short so that you can actually achieve placement and routing for it. And it will also probably require a lot of designer involvement in how the components of the latch loop are actually placed and routed.